people are moving towards plant foods because of their disenchantment with the way animals are treated. Factory farming today is pretty ugly. The old scene of the chickens running around in the backyard is gone. As you know, the way chickens are raised and the way cows are treated and so forth, very inhumane. And um, we, have, we have widespread outbreak of certain bacterial diseases. You see them listed here. And of course the question about is how good are we taking care of planet Earth? This uh, great planet that we've been given. Maybe living in the city you're not aware of how beautiful the Australia is, but get out and have a look sometime. I was walking Friday morning at Catherine's Beach, just south of Swansea, south of Newcastle. To be able to walk for five kilometres and not run into anybody and walking on white sand and fresh air and the blue sky and the blue ocean. It's fabulous. Millions of people, billions of people in the world don't have that privilege. So we're, we're spoilt in Australia with the beauties that we have and we can enjoy and we need to maintain that. And it's only possible by being good stewards. Um, there's a lot of I should just back up and say that in 2009 I co-authored the position paper on vegetarian diets for the American Dietetic Association which is now called the Academy of Nutrition and, P and Dietetics, A&D. But um, it was a privilege working with, with the organisation. It's a very political system. Um, we had to modify our language and throw out ideas and add other ideas. So the paper was, didn't turn out exactly the way that I wanted it to, but I think overall it still was able to present a very positive picture in, in terms of how a plant-based diet does protect us against many um, chronic diseases. And we were able to say, this is the, the reference that's given here, JADA, the Journal of American Dietetic Association, <coughs> the year, the volume and the page numbers if any of you wanting to write it down or you can just Google vegetarian diets and I'm sure it will come up. But we were able to say that appropriately planned vegetarian diets including total vegetarian, that was something new that we were able to put in there. We're not just talking about lacto-olvo, we're actually talking about vegan diets can also be nutritional and nutritionally adequate and healthful. But the key, the key is what I've underlined there. Okay, that's crucial. That is the key and that's where you all come in because church members and community people, they don't know how to appropriately plan. You can't, unless you grow up in a culture that follows this program, you don't just naturally know how to combine and work with things and have tasteful recipes. It's no good something being healthful if it doesn't taste any good. If it tastes yuck, then forget it. It's got to be, it, it's got to look good and smell good and taste good as well as being good for you. So, you know, it, it takes an art and that's where you come in. You have to take the basic ingredients and, and food items and be able to colourfully, attractively, tastefully put them together into a nutritious dish, dish that people will eat week after week after week. After all, we only eat about six to ten dishes, most of us. That's all we eat. That's what our, our monthly cycle is based on, a very small handful of dishes rice and tofu, barley soup, whatever it is for you, okay? It's only a very small amount. Well, the problem is that the average American, their, their thing is pizza and burger and steak and what have you, okay? We need to change that and give them nice, colourful, nice smelling and attractive looking and tasty, healthy substitutes for what they've been doing. And you just, quite frankly, 
when I, when I sit and think about what I had the last month before I left, there's only half a dozen or eight things, always embellished with fruits and vegetables, of course. And we want to be eating at least 10 servings a day. So a vegetarian diet is healthy, it's nutritionally adequate, provides benefits to prevent and treat certain diseases, and is appropriate for the whole life cycle, from the cradle to the grave. And it's also useful for ath athletes. This is what we were able to say, we were able to document, we were able to show with peer-reviewed scientific data, and it went through all of the committees. Believe me, reviews committees after another, and this is what we ended up with. This is what, this is what it says. In other words, this stands unchallenged because it's been through all the professional committees and word massaging and pulling and typing. <coughs> I think we should be pleased with that because this tells us that the Adventist dietary program makes sense and is healthy. We don't have to be embarrassed. But again, I emphasise appropriately planned. If we are reckless, if we are indifferent, if we are careless, and we think we just, I have a gut feeling as to what I should be eating, no, you're in trouble. There are deficiencies that are prevalent in the church today that many people don't know exist. You know, vitamin D and vitamin B12 that we'll be talking about are common because we are not careful enough. Choosing a nutritionally balanced vegetarian diet, I think, depends on two things. And one is, you know the stuff, and secondly, you can get the stuff. It's no use me talking about something if you can't find it in the store, okay? If it depends on some package or can or some sanitarium product that's available only in the big cities and not out in the countries, forget it. It's not going to work. It's got to be something that's available everywhere. Okay, so if we're going to promote a good balanced vegetarian diet, we have to educate people, but we have to highlight things that are, that are going to be available to them. Now, there's, there's six nutrients that we identify. There are others we talked about, but these are the six main ones which generally tend to be a concern. They are iron, calcium, zinc, B12, D, and omega-3, and I'm not going to have time to talk about all of them. We'll try in a few minutes to touch um, to touch the high points on some of these. <clears throat> a vegetarian diet in North America, and I can add Australia, can meet current recommendations for all of these nutrients. And it may be that we have to take a supplement or a fortified food, which after all is no different than a supplement, is it? If your soya milk has vitamin B12 in it, is there any difference between that and taking a pill of vitamin B12? Of course not. All that happens is that sanitarium made it easy for you so that you don't have to think, did I take my B12 today? No. You have your milk on your cereal every morning or your glass of soya milk, however you take it, and if you get one cup, you're getting enough for one day, I believe. For DRI is probably 50% and the labelling laws are such that you're actually getting adequate amounts. So you may have to take fortified foods. Now very quickly, uh, look at these mean intakes, these tables. The first table, vitamin D, non-vegetarian, lacto-over-vegetarian and vegan. And when you look at those numbers there, compared with the DRI, what do you notice? How do the numbers there, it doesn't matter which group you're looking at, how do the numbers compare with DRI, which is 15 micrograms? You know, $15 an hour is what I'm going to pay you. I say that in the contract, but I actually only pay you what's over there on the left. Are you going to be happy with that? <laughs> no. There's a big shortfall, right? Well, someone will say, oh, okay, but this is a sunshine vitamin. So we make up the difference with sunshine. Do you? What I see happening is Australians getting out of bed, 
getting into their air-conditioned car and driving to their office, staying in their office all day, getting back in the car and driving home in their air-conditioned car with the windows up, and they go inside, have their, have their tea, and then maybe they might go and play a little squash or racquetball or tennis or go for a walk or something, and it's usually way late in the day or early evening when the effect of the sunshine is nothing. And in the winter time, of course, the effect of the sun is minimised anyway. So what am I saying? Your exposure to making vitamin D from sunlight is not very good because of the lifestyle we live, mostly indoors. Okay, if you're a gardener or you're working outside, it's a different story. But many Australians are showing up with D deficiency because they're not getting exposed to sun and because our food is very difficult to get vitamin D. They put it in milk, they put it in soy milk. No, they don't put it in soy milk here. They do in America. They don't put it here. They put it in margarine. They now, they now are irradiating, and I know that word puts up all kinds of red flags, but this is UV, this is like sunlight, ultraviolet radiation of mushrooms. They are now able to get mushrooms to make vitamin D and they can sell mushrooms, so one serving of mushroom gives you your, your DRI for the day. But most people are not doing that, so it's, it's a problem. That's a problem. Vitamin D, you can see, is a problem, not for non-vegetarians, because it's found in animal products, but it is a problem for vegans. And if vegans are not taking sufficient fortification, they're going to be in the shortfall. Lacto-ova, kind of marginal there. Calcium, you can see all groups, the first two groups rather, are more or less okay. The vegans tend to be on a little bit on the low side. We'll come to you in just a minute. Iron, you'll see iron really isn't a problem. It may be the availability of the iron. And similarly with the zinc, it's not... It's not a ma major problem unless you're eating a marginal diet and not eating a wide variety of things. There was a question here. So. The vegetarian diet is obviously low in sat lower in saturated fat and cholesterol. It's loaded with vitamins and phytochemicals. And if you're using soy, you're getting the isoflavones, which are the special phytochemicals that are found in, in soy. And of course you're getting lots of fibre and fibre helps with so much of the chronic diseases. Your soluble fibre will help with your blood glucose, it'll help with your cholesterol, it helps a little bit with blood pressure. Um, so all around it's a lot of... Now what does this translate into? It means lower cholesterol, lower heart disease mortality, lower blood pressure, lower diabetes, lower body mass index or body weight and lower cancer rates. And I just say, yes, 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 bring it on. I mean, <laughs> if, it's, if there's this much going for it, then obviously this is the way to go. Now, at some point I listed the four main groups you see on the left, and then the four main chronic diseases across the top, CVDs, cardiovascular disease, and a Y stands for yes, meaning yes, if I do this on the left, eat this on the left, yes, it will help what's in that column and what do we notice? It's, it's a yes almost all the way across. In other words, if we're eating legumes and nuts and whole grains and fruits and vegetables, we're going to be covered for all the chronic diseases, not meaning that we won't get them, but that we're certainly going to have a reduction in risk. So you're today, Hollywood, Bollywood, icons, you know, all of them are following... Health, healthy diets. Um, what about vegan diets as, as opposed to lacto over vegetarian? Well, you see, this is taken from Dr. Fraser's book, the, the Kiwi, who's the head of the Adventist Health Study at Loma Linda. Vegans tend to be thinner, they have lower cholesterol, modestly lower blood pressure, and they're unlikely to have large advantages in disease patterns. This isn't seen. The, the ve vegans tend to have a better profile, lower diseases, but it's not dramatically. The jump between non-vegetarian and vegetarian 
and then vegetarian to v total vegetarian, that jump is not as pronounced as the first jump, okay? And I don't want anybody to walk out of this room thinking that if you become a vegan and you become a total vegetarian, you've climbed two rungs on the ladder of righteousness. <laughs> this is one of the problems we have in the church. Is we think that the more we get rid of in our diet, the more pure our mind will be, the, the better our spiritual... This is new age thinking. I'm serious, this is new age thing. They believe if they eat raw food, they're going to go to a higher spiritual experience. Don't fool ourselves. We can't use our knife and fork as the way to righteousness. It doesn't work that way. Eating is that we'll be healthier and that we will more fully reflect the beauty of Jesus and more fully reveal God's love. This is the purpose for the health message. It isn't so that we'll be stronger and smarter and less health expenses and all the rest. I mean, all these things, some of those things might be good downside, but it isn't the main reason. The main reason we have a health message and we follow it is because we are more able to represent Jesus and reveal the love of God to people. And through the health message, we win friends real friends, because people who enter the church through the health door usually don't go out the back door the next week. He gave us the original diet which was plant-based and it's good that we think in terms of, of that concept. So just quickly, what's the advantages of lacto-ovo over a vegan? Well, it's less restrictive, more choices. Right? So when you go to the uh, restaurant or whatever, there's more choices. You're better able to maintain optimal child growth. Okay? Children who are raised on vegan diets, the calories are lower, their body growth tends to be, they tend to be thinner, but not shorter, but they tend to be thinner. Greater calcium intake, more milk, more dairy, you know, people who are vegan sometimes, not always, sometimes they don't substitute and get enough calcium-rich food. Better B12 intake and there's no difference in iron. Milk and egg aren't really useful for iron, nutriture, so vegetarian, whatever you're on. Okay, what about the advantage of vegan over lacto-ovo? Well, there's less allergies. Milk and eggs are eliminated. So you have less concern about lactose. Less saturated fat and cholesterol because egg and milk have those. You have a better lipid profile. This is very clear in all the Adventist health studies. The, the closer you become to a vegan, the, the lower you have risk of heart disease, lower blood pressure, lower stroke. And for omega-3, we tend to eat more flaxseed. Okay, so um, I think we all know that as we eliminate animal products, we get rid of the risk or we lower the risk of heart disease. And this is true not only for whites, but also for African Americans. Oh, I don't think this has a pointer, does it? Does this have a pointer? Yes, it, does. it does. Is it this one in the middle? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Nice bright green. Thank you. I should have been using it. So you can see the cholesterol, 17% lower in, in the vegans. The LDLs, 22%. The ratio is 19 triglycerides. So in other words, the vegans have better lipid profile, which means they have less risk of heart disease. And this is true for Hispanics. I won't go through that. But, so it's not a racial thing. White, black, Hispanic, Asian, same thing. This is a study done in Barbados, and why I show this is because they separated the vegetarians to less than five years and greater than five years. And you'll see that body weight, obesity, diabetes, and hypertension of those who were recent vegetarians is really no different than non-vegetarian. But when you get to, over to the vegetarians for more than five years, you'll see they're much lighter, much lo lower risk of obesity, much less diabetes, and much less hypertension. So we need to stick at it, because when you stick at it, it shows it in the long run. 
cholesterol levels are lower. <coughs> and here you see an interesting report fruits and vegetables three times a day versus less than one time a day. And what do we see with people who regularly eat <coughs> fruits and vegetables? This is pathetic. Three servings a day? <laughs> I had that for breakfast this morning. A mango, a kiwi fruit, a banana, some raisins. But this is just, I mean, and this is the sort of difference you get. Stroke, 27% less. Stroke mortality, you go down the list, cardiovascular mortality. I mean, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? You eat your fruits and vegetables, and what happens? All of these um, problems are diminished. This is a British study. Again, this is body mass index or obesity, and you see, oops, you see the vegetarians are lower. They have a lower BMI, and the vegans even less. Five years or more, these are the thinnest of the lot. This is the latest data from the Adventist Health Study, and it's interesting. Compared to non-vegetarians, what do we find? The lacto-over vegetarians are about seven kilo lighter, and the vegans are about 12, 13 kilos lighter. This is looking at thousands of people. That's the data. Simple as that. If you're having a tr trouble with weight, going vegan is obviously going to help in that respect. Okay, this is high cholesterol. You see the same. The vegan have the lowest cholesterol, lacto-ovo in the middle, and the meat eaters the highest. And you get the same with blood pressure and diabetes. The vegans down here have the lowest percentage, less than 2%. Lacto-ovo is like 3%. And the non-vegetarian up here, 7%. Risk, I mean, not risk, but prevalence, incidence of diabetes. So clearly the major chronic diseases, overweight, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, animal products predispose you to risk and a diet heavily leaning towards plant does the opposite. This is what all the data shows. Yes? Uh, that study is only for sedentary events, and that's the group. Not, it's not compared to the outside uh, non-adventists. Non this is comparing Adventists with Adventists. Yes. So it gets rid of all those spurious other factors. Yep. Oh, so it's even stronger from that respect, because we get rid of you know, socio-economic or all the other things are being controlled for, smoking, so forth. Well, I won't take time to go over the iron status since I don't find it's a big problem. Um, vegetarians and non-vegetarians have the same level of anemia. There's no big issue. Now let me, I want to I spend five or ten minutes on this and then we'll have some questions. These are the four big concerns. B12, D, um, long chain omega-3 and bone density. These are the four areas that are of main concern with respect to um, vegetarians. B12, since only plant foods have B12, and I know you'll always, people will say, well Thursday night I was up at Avondale and somebody put their hand up, isn't it true that if you don't wash your lettuce, you get B12? I said, well, who's not going to wash their lettuce? Who knows what it was growing in? I spare the thought, please. Um, yeah, if you're not very hygienic, yeah, microorganisms, animals don't make B12, plants don't make it, it's microorganisms. Okay? So um, the only way plant eating people can get it is if the B12 is added to the plants. So what are the sources? Well in the states this is where we have and I correct, correct the list if it's not correct but fortified cereals, there are a number of cereal products that B12 is added and the most important thing is the three words is what? Read the labels. 
So you've got 25 or 35 cereals out there. Which one are you going to use? If you want to get B12, read the labels and find out which one has B12 in it. Read the DRI and see if you're getting enough. If you're not, then you're going to have to put milk on it or soya milk and not orange juice or some other thing you want to put on your cereal. There are beverages, rice, almond, oat, you know, all kinds of beverages out there now in the States. I know soya milk here in this country, your so good definitely has plenty of B12 added. And then there are vegetarian meats, not all of them, but some of them. So you, again, you have to read the label. There's a certain nutritional yeast, not all yeasts. Read the label to see whether it has it written in there. And if, if you don't eat any of those things, if you're a purist, you know, and you eat oatmeal and you eat only beans and lentils and you don't drink soya milk, you know what I mean? Someone who wants to eat only those sort of, they're not going to get any of one through four. So they're going to have to go to number five, which is taking uh, a supplement. And you'll notice that I'm recommending there at the bottom a, a key there, and that is chew your supplement. Studies have shown that if you pop a B12 supplement, it doesn't do anything for your blood value. You have to chew it, otherwise it's just straight through. Useless. Yeah, well, I, I wrote in there, you'll see those numbers there, because I wanted to know if this was for real. So I, I took this sublingual myself for three months, and I had a blood test before and three months later, and that's what happened. My value jumped 190 points. Picogram per mil is the unit we use. So it does work. Just put it under your tongue for 10, 15 minutes until it dissolve and the B12 goes in. These are unreliable sources that people will tell you about, but don't believe them. Seaweed, s fermented soy products, brewer's yeast, vegetables that haven't been washed, drinking water and so on. You know, you go to a health food store and they might say on the packet, so much B12, but these are, this is not the real active B12. These are cousins and nephews and nieces and aunties, okay, that don't have the true value. They look real, but they don't have any money to give you, okay? So you shun them. You want to find the real thing. Okay, so don't look for any of these. The most co common causes of B12 deficiency is achlorhydria. You don't have enough acid in your stomach. And when does that happen? Usually when you get past 50, your digestive juices start to peter out. So... They say that up to 25% of people in a nursing home um, who have mental changes is due to B12 deficiency. That's, I mean, that's serious. We think it's just normal ageing, but it's probably B12 in many cases. The other one is poor food selection, not getting B12 in our diet. And the breastfed baby who has a vegan mum of 10 or more years is what I would call a sitting duck. They are highly at risk because it's what the mother eats every day that goes into the milk. It's not what her stores are. And if she's a vegan and she's not getting proper B12, then her baby probably isn't. And within six months, you can see the child is B12 deficient. Their physical development is slow. They're just... Um, Failure to thrive, classic failure to thrive, okay? And these are some of the things we see in B12 deficient problems. Paresthesia, the, you know, spider's grip or, or what do we call it here? Uh, pins and needles, um, not being balanced in walking, changes in mood and memory, and difficulty with mental concentration. Please, please, some of you looking at this list, don't say, oh, I've got that, I've got that. <laughs> that uh, aging also does the same thing, okay? But we forget and we can't remember things and we put our keys down and we're looking all around, we don't know where the keys are. We can't find our glasses and they're right on our head. And, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. 
So the recommendation is for people over 50, they should have B12. The answer is not eating meat because the B12 has to be digested from the protein. The answer is eating B12 in foods where it's fortified. In other words, like so good or like a breakfast cereal because the B12 that's added, that's fortified, requires no digestion. Does it require the acid in the stomach? So it's much easier to absorb. And if you're a long-term vegan, you should be monitored regularly. And the best way to do it is to ask for a methyl malonic acid test, because that's the sure way to know whether you're deficient. The typical way they do is to measure the blood level of B12, but that's not going to tell you accurately, yes. Yeah, I, I know the case you're talking about, like five or six years ago, wasn't it? Well, you know, the simple story is the B12 deficiency killed the baby, but it's much more complicated than that. I think there are other infections and so forth, but certainly B12 deficiency will weaken a child. They don't, they don't grow properly. They're more likely to get other diseases and so forth, and it's not a responsible thing to raise a child on a total vegan diet that isn't with some fortification or with a pill. Okay, vitamin D now. We've already talked about this somewhat. We need 10 or 15 minutes um, out in the high sun. You know, the sun that's before 10 o'clock or after 3 o'clock, forget it. It's not going to do the job. You want it, at, you want it high in the sky. That's that's the most dangerous time I know. That's the time where the doctor says you don't go out without being covered. Well, you only need like 10 minutes, 15 minutes at that time of the day, every day. And um, during winter time, you know, if any, well, I don't know what the latitude is here in Victoria, but it's probably around 35, is it? Degrees south, somewhere around that. I know Hobart's like 42, I think, so... It, at this sort of latitude, winter months, forget it, nothing's happening. The sun is over, is over Washington DC or over New York City and the, the rays are so angled, so weak coming down to the southern hemisphere during your winter, forget it. June, July, August, don't count on vitamin D production. This time of year, sure, if you're out there. So you need exposure. Well, we say here two or three times a week. You know, we don't know exactly how much. It depends on colour of skin and age of skin and exactly what time of the day. So, you know, if, if you're out there three times a week for 10 or 15 minutes, that should do it. This, this is just a graph to show you um, the production. And zero, you can see the line at the bottom. Edmonton is in Canada, which is at about 54, 55 degrees north. And you can see from October, over here October, November, December, and then over January, February, March, sits flat, nothing, zip, nada, nothing, right? So clearly, um, when you live closer to the tropics, here's Puerto Rico, even in winter, plenty eh, in the tropics. But you live in high latitudes like Boston, 42 degrees, Edmonton, 50 something degrees, a large part of the year where no vitamin D production is occurring. So where do we get it? Again, from beverages, except I think in Australia that doesn't happen. It's sad. I've asked Sanitarium about it and they give me a big story. I don't know why they can't do it, but it needs to be ready to eat cereals margarine, orange juice in the States is now being fortified with vitamin D, as is calcium. So those who are lactose intolerant and they can't handle milk, it's okay. 
We put calcium and vitamin D in your orange juice. So I hope that's happening here also. This is an experiment with um, premenopausal vegans and you can see what I want to highlight here is vitamin D intake was almost nothing and the spinal bone, min bone mineral density, BMD, is below normal. Of course, this is Finland, 60 degrees north, but this just shows you if you are not careful, this is what can happen. Vitamin D intake can impact on bone health. Okay, I'm, what I'm saying basically here is that there are receptors all over your body. Pancreas, brain, heart, lung, lung bone, nerve tissue, vitamin D receptors everywhere. So therefore, what's vitamin D necessary for? Only bones? Then why are there receptors for it in the heart and in the brain? Clearly there's a lot more we don't know about vitamin D that's yet to be discovered. So don't think if your bones are okay, it's okay, my vitamin D is okay. You don't know. The latest data shows that vitamin D deficiency is connected with depression. And there's probably many other things. They think it's also associated with diabetes. And on and on. More research we need, obviously. And then omega-3, I think we've already... We already covered this a little bit before. I don't want to go through all this, but brain function and blood coagulation and so forth. There are three, three main fatty acids. The plant source, which is alpha-linolenic acid, which is given by this symbol, and then there are the fish oils. And of course the question is, um, we really need DHA. DHA is the key to all of this. And... Um, before we look at that, here we have some vegetarian sources of these three. And of course the one that really interests us is EPA and DHA. Today we are now, we are now generating eggs that have DHA in them. And we're now finding it in seaweed. We're now providing vegan supplements of DHA from extracts of seaweed. There's a soya milk. You all, you've all heard of silk? Any of you travel to the US? Silk is the major um, available in all the stores and there's one brand of it now that ad actually adds DHA. So there are more and more breakfast bars, energy bars are adding DHA to it. So read labels, maybe these things are coming onto the market here too. But if we don't have any of these then clearly we have to rely on flaxseed and walnuts and the question is does this get converted effectively to the DHA and the answer is we don't know we're not sure it's not very efficient but before we go into there I think we mentioned this in the last um, program the various sources of, of omega-3 your chia kiwi seed flaxseed walnuts even hemp we're a little nervous of that, aren't we? Very popular beverage in the States is now made from hemp. There's no cannabinoids in it. There's no hallucinatory marijuana sort of thing. It's okay. Okay, look at this. Conversion of flax omega-3 to the EPA, the fish oil. And here's the conversion of the flax fatty acid to DHA, the one we need for brain function and eye development. And what do you see over here? A bit depressing, isn't it? Shows you that it's not very efficiently converted. But those of you who are of the female gender, you're smiling because you, you're, you're doing pretty good. But look at the men, not looking so good. It seems like estrogen upregulates this process, which makes it more effective. There was one study last year that showed that, that all of these studies were based on people who used fish. And if, in fact, you do the studies of conversion on people who are non-fish eaters, the percentage conversions are much better. So you can go home feeling a little better now. 
Okay, and then we'll finish on this, and then we must quit. Um, the bone structures, and again, this was a big British study done at Oxford with, with Key and Appleby, their group, and you'll notice the, here the incidence of fractures. And we're setting meat eaters at one. This gives you the number of people N in the group. And here's the vegetarians. Any difference? Nope. Vegans. What do we notice? This is fracture. We're looking at 1.3. That means 30% higher rates of fracture in vegans compared to other vegetarians and meat eaters. Doesn't look very good, does it? Well, they adjusted this data and one of the adjustments they did was they took people who were eating 525 milligrams of calcium a day. Now, what does that equal? That's about two glasses of soya milk or two glasses of milk a day. And when they, when they, adjust, when they adjusted these 1,126, in other words, they cut out all those who were eating less than that and did the analysis only on those in the upper calcium intakers, what did they find? What did they find about the fracture rate? Look at those numbers. No different. So what's the conclusion? If you're a vegan, you're in trouble unless you're eating enough calcium. And the last picture we showed you was you're in trouble with bones unless you're eating enough vitamin D. So are vegans at risk? Yes. Do they have to be at risk? No. What's the difference? Remember the first two words we emphasized in this lecture? Careful planning. You have to know what you're doing. If you don't make sure your foods have vitamin D and calcium in them, you could be putting your bones at risk. Okay? Um, soy protein, we mentioned that, is rich in isoflavones. And vegetarian diets are rich in vitamin K and vegetarians tend to use a lot more herbs rather than salt. And all these things help with calcium retention. I have a lecture, I wish we had time to give it, and it's, it's entitled Osteoporosis. It's more than just about calcium because there's about 15 different things that impact on bone health. Calcium's just one of them. Vitamin D, vitamin K, isoflavones, salt, protein, caffeine, age, amenorrhea. I mean, you, there's a lot of things we could say add up. A lot of things. So the people who are using a plant-based diet with lots of magnesium and potassium-rich fruits and vegetables are helping with their alkaline balance. Okay, this is just the vitamin K story that shows that people who eat lettuce and broccoli and other things have significant reduction in risk of hip fracture. Here's your hip fracture and here's serving of green leafy vegetables. One or less a week versus one every day. Look at that tremendous drop in risk of hip fracture. Nothing to do with calcium. Well, it does have something, but it's, this is looking focusing on vitamin K. And this is the isoflavones that we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, we better quit there. Um, the key is variety.